Shake somebody's hand another time and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, the Lord will provide. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord will provide. Divine insight is essential to spiritual growth. Insight is defined as an instance of apprehending the true nature of a thing, especially through intuitive understanding, penetrating mental vision or discernment, faculty of seeing into inner character or underlying truth. If you look at the word provision, it is a compound word of two different words, the word pro and the word vision. So it is implied that in order to understand what provision is, you have to have sight, or more importantly, insight. But provision simply is the foresight that God has beforehand. As Paul taught us this way, he said, God has knowledge of what we need even before we ask. We thank God for provision because many times if we're honest with ourselves, we don't really know what we need. We have things that we want that we really don't need. But other times, we have things that we need that we really don't want. Many times, we fail to see the provisions that God has placed in the pathways of our life. You've heard the story about the old man that was in the town when the flood was coming. They received weather alerts and meteor meteorological warnings that a severe flood was going to take over the town and so they had gotten everybody out of the town and there was one old man left there on a house off the old dusty road and they sent the fire trucks out and they said come on old man the flood is coming you better come with us and he said don't worry the Lord is going to take care of me so the fire trucks left, and later the flood waters began to rise. They brought in boats, and the old man was upstairs in his house, and he waved off the boats, and he said, come on, old man, the flood is here, and you're going to drown if you stay. And he said, don't worry, the Lord is going to take care of me. The flood waters continued to rise. By this time, the old man was up on the house, and uh, they sent a helicopter out, and uh, they said, come on, old man, if you stay here, you're going to die. And he says, don't worry, the Lord is going to take care of me. The story told the old man died and went to heaven, and he asked God a question. He said, God, I thought you was going to take care of me. He said, well, I sent a fire truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? We ought to fail to see the provisions that God has placed in our pathways. We have specific expectations of what we want from God, but we do not want the work that is needed to achieve the expectation. God requires our best sacrifice in order to raise us to the next level. Many times, some of us are at the fire truck level of seeing God's provision. Other times, some of us are at the boat level of seeing God's provision. But some of us are so hard-headed, even after the fire truck and the boat, when the helicopter comes, we still can't see God. God wants the church to make practical sacrifices in order to achieve the, our true destiny. And sacrifices are the surrender or destruction of something that is prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. In other words, you have to learn to give up something in order to gain something greater. You have to learn to devalue something that is a priority now in order to receive something that is of a greater value later. In other words, patience is shown through the concept of delayed gratification. Now, we have to learn to give up some things that we value in order to get a better understanding of what God wants most from us. The word provision is the arrangement or preparation beforehand as of doing something, the meeting of needs or the supplying of means. Provisions were made for you to be here at church today. Somebody had to get the clothes ready. Somebody had to get your body ready. Somebody 
and to make sure the roads uh, were safe uh, for you to travel on uh, as you went down the highways and hedges. Somebody had to make sure that the air conditioner was on. Somebody had to make sure that the lights were working. And somebody had to make sure all the sound and the and setting were appropriate for a worship experience. Uh, but many times we don't think about all of the provisions that are made beforehand uh, before we take advantage of what we believe is rightfully ours. God's provision, everybody say provision. God's provision supersedes man's provision because it is prepared before we ever thought we would have the need. We see many people lacking the basic necessities in our world. Right now in Africa, there are 30 million people that are experiencing a famine. They're lacking the, the basic food, 1,800 calories that are needed in order to make it from day to day. They, they are lacking shelter. They're lacking clothing. And even here in America, people, uh, some 40 million Americans, are lacking access to health care. God's remedy to meet the basic provisions of life are through the relationships developed through the body of Christ. In other words, that's why we have the church. Everybody who is a part of the body is automatically connected to God, but they're also connected to other believers in God. And maybe they will not be able to give you a physical, tangible provision, but they can provide you with a testimony of how God can see you through hunger, see you through nakedness, see you through a lack of shelter to see you even through dangers seen and unseen. God has provided provision not only through his son Jesus Christ, but through all of those men and women who are connected to his body that have a testimony that provides a emphatical truth that the Lord will provide. The church is the body of believers who understand God's power of provision and share the resources of God's provision to those who are in need. That's where ministry comes in. Everybody say ministry. That's why the church is still here because there are always people who are need to be ministered to. There are always the poor, the forgotten, the downtrodden, the neglected, the dejected, the depressed, the frustrated, and the famined are here in this world world because they can be ministered to by those who understand that they're connected to God through the body, but they also are here to make provision. Genesis 22 records a story that we've all heard before. The story of Abraham offering his son Isaac on the altar. Offering Isaac on the altar was the hardest test that Abraham ever faced. But he came through victoriously because he trusted God. He had experienced resurrection power in his own body because it was said that a man, once he reached a certain age, he could no longer bear a son. He could no longer cause a woman to conceive and have a child. When God approached Abraham and told him that he would be a father of a new nation, and he would bless those and that bless him and curse those that curse him, and that all of the people of the world would be blessed through his seed, Abraham was already 70 years old. 11 years had went by and even his wife Sarah had laughed at the promise that God had gave Abraham that she would bear a son and she thought that maybe perhaps it would be Hagar, her maid servant, that would be the one that would bear a son. And so she coerced her husband Abraham to conceive through Hagar. But Hagar had a son named Ishmael and that's what happened when we try to help God out with the information that he gives us, when we try to help God out, instead of getting an Isaac, we get an Ishmael. In other words, here is Abraham now, uh, some many years later, after have received the promise of Isaac, his firstborn son through his wife, Sarah. In their old age, God worked a miracle, and now Isaac is now a full-grown young boy now, and he is a part of the promise, but now his faith is going to be tested. It was a test of faith. Anybody out there that had their faith tested? 
Anybody used to have black hairs like me, but now you got gray hairs? Are there anybody out there that feels like that you have been tested to, to the point of no return, but you know that on the other side of that test is a testimony? For Abraham, it was a test of faith, far more difficult than any previous test that involved his nephew Lot or his first son Ishmael. God was testing him to get him to another level of faith. The question we have today is how do we trust God's provision? When we can't see his hand, how do we trust his heart? The first lesson is you got to take the test from God. Let me say take the test. A lot of us suffer from test anxiety. When we hear that the test is coming, and now that the test is here, we get so nervous about taking the test because the implications are very strong if we fail. If we fail the test, we are worried about what others will think of us. We are worried about how we will even feel about ourselves. We are, oh, sometimes we even worried about disappointing the God who sent us the test. And if you're like me, you, you will grow out of the fear of what others think. Even if you get a little higher in the faith, you will even grow beyond the fear of disappointing yourself. And if you're truly serious about your faith, when the test comes, the only major concern you have is the fear of disappointing God. See, Abraham had been spoken to by God. And in verse number one, it tells us that God said to Abraham, here I am, says Abraham, take your son. Verse 1, that word test, it comes from the word nasar, which means to try, to prove, or literally it means to venture. And that's why I believe that the churches of the world are struggling with the concept of ministry is because we don't want to go outside of the four walls of the church. Ministry is not just in the sanctuary. Ministry is also for the penitentiary. And ministry is also for the drug houses. And ministry is also for the orphanage and the nursing homes and when we desire to please God we will venture out of our four walls of the church and prove to God that even with our own financial trouble even with all our physical ailments we still desire to make provisions for those who are less fortunate than we are how could Abraham a man of his wisdom and his wealth and his relationship with God, why would he need to prove anything to anybody? Did he need to prove it to his servants? Did he need to prove it to Isaac? Or did he need to prove it to himself? Or, or did he need to prove it to God that he takes the calling upon his life so seriously that whatever God asks him to go, he will go. Whatever God asks him to do, he will do. Whatever God tells him to say, he will say it. Abraham is now at a different point in his life where he no longer has to prove anything else to his children or his servants or, or even to himself. The only test that he now has to perform is to prove his faith in God. You'd be surprised about the students in school who don't show up for a test. You'd be surprised about the number of people when the opportunity comes to get the job interview, the opportunity comes to get married, when the opportunity comes to go out on that date with that special man or special woman, they fail to even show up. Abraham is showing us how to step up to the plate and take the test. Abraham does not know all of the details. And maybe that's what's wrong with the churches, where we have to have it all figured out before we sign the dotted line. We have to have all of the details in order to make that commitment. But what we realize is that if God gives us all of the details, there's no growth in it for us. If God gives us all the details, there's no maturity in it for us. If God tells us everything, then we won't appreciate the blessing on the other side of the text. Many of us are struggling with where God is leading us, but we at least have to commit to taking the test. Touch me and say, take the test. So Abraham signs up for the test. The test says, take your son. 
your only son Isaac, whom you love, who to the land of Moriah, and offer him up there as a burnt offering on the mountains, I will tell you about. In other words, God tells him where, he tells him what, he tells him who, but he doesn't tell him how. That's the big piece that we all want to know. We don't know how, but we know God's going to do it. We don't know when, but we know he's going to fix it. We don't know where, but we know that he's going to make a way for us. That's why we sing the song, Lord, he's going to do it and give us the victory. Take the test from God. Secondly, we have to trust the trial for God. Just let say trust the trial. Now, for those of us who have taken any type of trip of any length, we know that certain provisions are needy, needed before you venture out on the trip. If you're like me, you may have the problem of packing at the last minute. If you're like me, you sometimes don't map out all of the stops that you're going to make in order to get to your final destination. If you're like me, you, you have an idea of where you want to end up, but you don't know all the details of how you're going to get there. So Abraham, as a man of means, he knows that he needs his beast of burden. As a man of means, he knows he needs servants to help with building the altar. As a man of means, he knows that by receiving the instructions, from God. He needs wood for the altar, and he also needs to make sure that he brings along his son. And many times when we look at the Bible, we fail to remember that it was Mary and Joseph as they were traveling on when Jesus was 12 years old. They had made it all the way two days on their journey and had looked around, and Jesus was nowhere to be found. They had forgotten to look for their son Jesus. And many times we forget to take Jesus with us on our journey because we assume that somebody else is watching Jesus. But Abraham did not miss the opportunity to get what God had for him. He made sure he had the fire. He made sure he had the wood. He made sure he had the altar. But most of all, before he went out on the journey, he made sure he took his son. My brothers and sisters, when God tells you to do it, he's not going to give you all the details. But make sure that you follow the instructions that he does give you so that the provisions that will be made in advance while you're on the journey, you will start to discover as you walk along the ventures and the pathways of life that God is still working miracles while you are making each footstep. This is why old folks said it this way. You take one step, God will make two. What he does for others, he will do the same for you. Verse 8 is the transition verse of our text. It tells us that God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Then the two of them walked on together. See, I like this part of the verse because Isaac wasn't a little bit boy like A.J. when the story was taking place. He had to be strong enough to carry the wood up the mountain. He also had to be smart enough to pay attention to his surroundings. He said, Dad, I see the wood, daddy, I see the altar, but I don't see no lamb. I ain't no fool, daddy. It looked like to me that you got a knife in your hand, and you get ready to use that knife for something. And I might have been born at night, but I wasn't born last night. And it looks like to me you tried to kill somebody, and that somebody looks like me. So not only did Abraham have to have faith, Isaac had to have faith as he went up the mountain. See, many of us have faith for ourselves, but we don't have the faith to walk with somebody on the journey that God has assigned us. We're too quick to give up on people. We're too slow to minister to people. But while I'm on this tedious journey, I need somebody to walk with me. The provisions being made. This is Abraham saying that God himself will provide. That word provide comes from the word which means see. It literally means to make an inspection. So as Abraham is looking to the hills and as Isaac is looking at Abraham, Isaac is seeing that God must be getting ready to do something. But it, even though I don't know exactly what God is going to do, I'm going to trust my father enough to walk with him up this mountain. And as Abraham remembered 11 years before Isaac was born, 
more that God had made a promise that he was going to bless him and that he was going to bless his seed and bless all the people of the world through his seed. Abraham had enough intuition to know that the same God that gave him Isaac in his old age will be the same God that will make provision on the mountain when he walks up the hill. And that's why you got to pray for God to be able to give you the power to trust him through the trials of life. Take the test from God. Trust the trial for God. But thirdly, you got to tame the territory with God. Just name say tame the territory. Amen, brothers. This, this is a shouting verse. This is a celebration verse right here. It tells us in verse number 14 that, and Abraham named that place the Lord will provide so that today it is said it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Let me tell you what happened if you didn't know between verses 8 and verse 14. While they were up there on the mountain, just Abraham and just Isaac and the altar. As Isaac and Abraham build the altar, they left the the servants at the foot of the mountain after a long tedious journey up the hill Isaac began to see the wood being built on the altar he began to lay down on the altar he began to see Abraham tie his arms to the altar he began to smell the crackling of the fire below he began to hear the wood burning he began to see the smoke lifting he began to see I Abraham with the knife in his hand and as Abraham reached way back as far as he could after he had followed the instructions from his heavenly father then in the midst of they all an angel of the Lord appeared and said Abraham do not harm the boy do not touch anything on his body God has provided a ram when it looks like you have reached your end God steps in right on time. But it looks like you are fit to be tied. Abraham looked and saw a ram. That's the key word in our lesson today. It's important to see, church. It's important not only to see your situation. It's not only important to see others' situation. But you also need to be looking for what God has in store for you. I can see Abraham as he's there with his beard and sweat rolling down his face and tears rolling down his eyes. I can see him looking at Isaac with one eye on the altar and looking at the knife with the other eye. But even in this peripheral view, he's looking around for God's provision. And if he didn't look around for God's provision, he would have missed the opportunity to find a ram. And somebody said, why was it a ram? A ram is stronger than a lamb. A ram is a male sheep. A ram can see a predator at 200 yards away. A ram can shake itself away from a predator with his strong hind legs. How in the world did a ram, God's best, get caught in a bush that was caught in the midst of Mount Moriah? And I want to say to you, church, that this wasn't no ordinary ram. This was a ram that was provided to by God. And that's what God does in our situations. When we're hungry, he provides a ram. When we're thirsty, he provides a ram. When we're sleepy, he provides a ram. And when we're tired, he provides a ram. Not so that we can be brag or boast about ourselves so that we can tame the territory. That's what the word take means. It means take your hands off your son and put your hands on the ram. And we now know that the ram is Jesus. Jesus wants us to take him by the hand and seize the opportunity to not only go with God, but also to be a blessing for God. Because the reason why he wants us to take authority is so that we cannot be losers in this journey, but so that we can win. Are you tired of being conquered by your troubles? Are you tired of being ruled by your problems? Are you tired of the devil running in and out of your life? Whatever he can 
is ready. I'm looking for some people who are saying I'm here today to stand on God's provision and say I'm taking authority. I'm taming the territory. No more drugs in my community. No more alcohol in my body. No more fear in my heart. No more. No more. Is anybody here that's ready to stand and tell the devil, no matter what your bank account says, tell the doctor, no matter what your body says, the Lord will provide. Is anybody here that's been tested? That the greatest test of Abraham came after he received the promise after a long wait. The test was very real. He was to give Isaac back to God. And as a test, it was designed to prove his faith. And for it to be a real test, he had to defy his logic. It had to be something that Abraham really wanted in order for him to resist. Is there somebody here that said, well, Reverend, I've been tested. I've been tried. I've been through tribulations. But I threw it all. I know that the Lord will provide. He did it for my mother. He did it for my father. But most of all, he did it for me. And I've got a testimony that he seen me through dangers, seen and unseen. He picked me up and he turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground. Is anybody here? stand here today and say the Lord will provide. Many of you know him as Jehovah Shalom. That means God is our peace. But today I want you to know him as Jehovah Jireh. That means the Lord will provide. There's a story I gotta tell you before I take my seat. There's a story told about a husband and his wife. He rolled down the road one day and he saw a sign that said experience the thrill of flying. He went to the man because he wanted to take his wife on a plane trip. And he said that he needed to give him the price. And little did he know that once they agreed on the price, he said that the price would go up if you and your wife say anything while you're on the flight. So the husband agreed, and off they got on the plane, and off they went. Little did they know, the pilot was going to do some nose dives. He was going to do some loop-de-loops. He was going to do some happy turns. So they would have to speak up and pay the higher price. So after they were flying, the plane dived, and the plane turned. The plane spin, and the plane rolled. But not at all did the pilot hear one word while they were on the flight. And he got to the ground. He said, it's amazing that you didn't say anything the entire flight. And the husband said, yeah, it's a shame. I didn't say anything. But my wife fell out the plane. Is there somebody here that knows somebody that's so selfish, that's so stingy, they don't care who falls. I'm glad God ain't like us, because when I fall, he's there to catch me. He'll pick me up, because he's a rock in a weary land. He's a bread in a starving land. How can I get one witness that know he'll pick you up? Turn you around, place your feet on, solid 